glad you're here this evening at Lakeview Church. Uh, I know you're glad to be here. Let me see you uh, wave your hand if you are. Good. Look at all that. People can actually do that. That's awesome. We're not the geriatric crowd. Hallelujah. No. <laughs> Especially this group right over here. Uh, but anyway, we're just so glad you're here tonight. Uh, I want to share just a couple of announcements with you. Uh, first of all, you know that we're in 21 days of prayer, 6 a.m. every morning, 9 o'clock on Saturday, and then Sunday, of course, our service times serve as our prayer, our prayer time. But these, uh, these prayer times are so important, and we would love for you to, uh, to join us. You can join us either by coming out at 6 a.m., or you can join us online you can join us online live at 6 a.m., or you can watch it throughout the day and, and take opportunity to do your prayer time each day whenever it's convenient for you if you can't be here at 6 o'clock. And so I want to encourage you. How many know how important it is to pray first? A lot of times things happen and we say, well, I guess we should pray. Well, maybe we should have prayed already, right? And so praying first is our first move. Uh, we want to also remind you that um, this Sunday we have our third installment of our series, the series called Stress Out. So you'll want to be there for that. It's been a good series. How many enjoyed Sunday service? I know Pastor Clint did a great job. Let's give him a big hand. Amen. I know it was good. I know Pastor Daniel did well over in, in Vernon. We just had a great Sunday. Um, Dana and I, we, we weren't here. We were on a boat, but we, needless to say, we, uh, we took vacation. We thought about watching church, but I couldn't get it on my phone, so we didn't do it. So anyway, uh, let me go one more step. Let's see what else we've got. Okay, starting, well, connection cards. If you would like to give a prayer request for 21 Days of Prayer, you can use the connection card. It's located near you in a seat pocket. Uh, use that connection card and just go ahead and bring your prayer requests on down here. Uh, that way, or actually, you can put them in the box. Then we'll look at them and then we'll bring them down here and folks will pray over them. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Also, if you need to give, if that's something that you'd like to do or you want to bring your tithes and offerings, uh, you can do that. There's three different ways. You can see that, lakeviewpeople.com give. Text to give with that number on the screen. You can give in the boxes back here. Also, you can give in the app. Uh, we have a Lakeview app now. If, you're, if you've not done that, it'll change your life. You can stay connected to everything going on right here at Lakeview Church by uh, downloading that app and uh, finding out what's happening. Finally, next, Wednesday, uh, next month, um, first Wednesday, well... So I'll t talk about two things, but that's not what I was going to talk about. I was going to talk about First Wednesday. First Wednesday is going to be our um, small group fair. First Wednesday in February is going to be our small group fair, and small groups will kick off the following week. And so I want to encourage you to come that night for the fair. There's so many things that you'll find out about all the different groups. Also, if you're interested in hosting a small group, uh, not this weekend, but the following weekend, we will have a small group training. If you're doing, if you're hosting a small group, you uh, attendance there is, is required. Please come, bring your idea for your small group. It can be anything. You can have a small group at Starbucks, you can have one at McDonald's, and you can have one at Taco Bell, and we can just take over the access road. Amen? And so we can do that. Or you can have one at your house. Um, it can be a book study, it can be with men, it can be with women, uh, men with men, women with women, you got that right. Uh, you can have a couple study. Uh, there's all kinds of things that you can do, and so we want you to bring those. We've got several people that have been uh, hosting small groups. There's some new folks that need to step up and host a small group, and so we want to encourage you to come to that. That'll be <clears throat> the fourth Sunday of this month in, on Sunday afternoon. With that said, everybody stand with me tonight. We're going to sing a song. Um, I want you to worship God with this song. Just sing this song from your heart. Uh, let God know how much you love him and how much you appreciate what he does for you. We'll open in prayer, and then he'll play this song, and then we'll share the message with you tonight. Father, we thank you so much for an opportunity again in the middle of the week just to gather with God's people, just to gather with you and to, 
just in, encourage one another, lift one another up, but also glorify you and give you the praise that's due your name. Father, I thank you for your presence here tonight in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.
That's a good song. And now you can be seated tonight. Greet somebody as you're seated. Tell them you look good tonight. Amen. Don't get yourself in trouble. All right. One thing I forgot to mention about, it was the main thing I was going to mention, about the first week in February on Wednesday nights, we're changing the time to 630. So we'll meet at 630, and that will correspond with our small groups. And so small groups will have plenty of time to be able, if they do any small groups on Wednesday night, we'll have, uh, on Wednesday nights we'll have children's ministry here, youth ministry, nursery. So anybody that's hosting a um, small group on a Wednesday night, you can u- utilize those services, have people drop their kids off and then come to their small group. Okay? And so uh, 6.30, what'd I say? Good. You'll tell everybody, right? Good. Amen. All right. Tonight, we are going to do a series. It'll be tonight and the next two Wednesday nights at, at 7 o'clock. All right? 7 o'clock. Don't, we're not going to 6.30 until February. But it's called Intercession Outcome-Based Praying. We want to pray with the outcome in mind. Amen? We're praying with the outcome in mind. And so that's what outcome-based praying is all about. It's nothing more than that. It's not some new fangled way of praying. It's intercession. And intercession has been around for a long, long time. Intercession, and you can see this in your notes. It's at the very top. It says this, praying on another's behalf is called intercession. Praying on another's behalf is called intercession. And so intercession, uh, you can see it throughout Scripture, um, uh, actually, in um, I'm, I'm thinking of, of one opening in, in uh, Ephesians where it talks about intercession. Intercession is something that uh, it's one type of prayer, okay? How many of you have ever heard the word supplication? You've heard the word supplication. Prayers, thanksgivings. There's multiple types of prayers found in the Bible, and each prayer operates by kind of like different rules, You follow what I'm saying? And it's not like um, uh, some people, they tag every prayer if it be your will, right? But that's not really every type of prayer. Matter of fact, that type of prayer is called the prayer of dedication or consecration. Where you say, God, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. Whatever is your will, that's what I'll do. You know, whatever your will is, that's what I'll do. I'm consecrating to your will whatever your will is. But the Bible tells us that outcome-based praying is when you pray according to the will of God. You know already know what the will of God is, all right? And so you're praying that the will of God would play out in a given situation. Well, in intercession, that's one of the areas we really want to use Scripture in praying for people in our life. Now, you can't possibly know everything that's going on in another person's life. How many would say, I don't know everything that's going on in my own life? But I know that there are some people sometimes that need somebody praying for them. And that's when I want to go to the Lord on their behalf. And so, therefore, intercession is a selfless act. It's selfless. It benefits you not at all, really. Uh, It does benefit you in one way, that you're spending time with God. Come on. So that is a great benefit. But intercession is a selfless act. It's sometimes considered the highest form of prayer. Jesus' ministry of intercession continues today. The Bible tells us, Paul said this, that Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So that means Jesus is praying for you. How many think if Jesus is praying for you, he's getting his prayers answered? Yes, he is. He's getting his prayers answered. In Hebrews uh, chapter 7, verse 25, it's not in your notes, but let me share this, what the writer says of Jesus. He said, Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him. So what that means is if you've come to God through Jesus, Jesus has the ability to save you. In the King James, it says to the uttermost or completely, that your salvation is complete. It's not, it's lacking no good thing. Amen. That's the way Jesus saves. Jesus, he does everything well. Come on. He does everything well. But notice what it says about Jesus. He's able to save completely those who come to God through him. Why? Because he always lives to intercede 
for them. So he hung on a cross, died on a cross, shed his blood, went to hell, paid for your sins so that you could be saved today. But he said, but that's not enough. When I get to heaven, I'm going to be praying for them too. Come on, we have a great high priest in Christ Jesus. But just hours before his arrest, and then he was subsequently crucified, Jesus spent time for his disciples as well as for those who would, would believe their message. And how many know those that believe the message of the disciples are the ones that preach to somebody else, who preached to somebody else, who preached to somebody else, who eventually shared Christ with you. And so Jesus, on, uh, just hours before he cru was crucified, was also praying for you. How do we know that? In your notes, John 17, 9. I pray for them. Jesus said this, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. They are yours. So at that moment, he's praying for his disciples. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. So there's the authority. He says, but in the authority of your name, protect them. The name you gave me, the name of Jesus, so that they may be one as we are one. And then in verse 20 and 21, he said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is Jesus talking to God. It's prayer. And what is he doing? He's interceding on the behalf, not only of his disciples, but you. I can show you in the Bible, Jesus prayed for you. Right there in John 17, 20 and 21. So Jesus not only came to talk to people about God, right? He didn't only come to talk to people about God but to talk to God about people. And he is still talking to God on your behalf today. And that's awesome to just get that picture in my mind that God's praying for me. You know, that gives me a great, or Jesus is praying for me. That gives me great relief. That means I don't have to be perfect. I just have to be obedient. Amen. I don't have to be perfect. I have to be obedient. If I mess up, if I make a misstep, Jesus is praying for me. And he is praying that I would be drawn back to him, that I would stand before him and say, yep, I messed up. Thank you, God, that your, the blood of Jesus covers my sins. Not only covers them, but washes them away as though sin never existed. And that is an awesome thing. I've got a God in heaven whose son is. Is praying for me. So before we go further, I want to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you so much for each person in here. And I pray right now, my prayer right now, is that we would all take up the mantle of Jesus. That we would all say, if it's good enough for Jesus to pray for others. And he does it without uh, end. Then I can pray for other people. I can pray for them. Lord Jesus, help us to become prayers. Help us to be compelled to pray for certain people. In Jesus' name, amen. I use that compelled to pray because a true intercessor. See, everybody's called to intercede. Everyone's called to pray for other people, right? Everyone. But then there's some people that that's a ministry to them, a ministry of intercession. That they're the ones that will say, hey, I don't need to come to the service. Find me a room that I can pray for the preacher while he's preaching. That's an intercessor. I don't need to go to the hospital. Just call me and tell me what's happening. I'll pray while you go to the hospital. How many want somebody praying for you while you're visiting your friends in the hospital? Praying for you and for the folks that are in the hospital. That's a true intercessor. Someone says, I don't need to go anywhere. There's no distance in the spirit. I can hit my knees right here in my living room and I can pray for you no matter where you are on this planet. And God's bigger than time. God's bigger than space. And God can answer each and every prayer I pray as I pray according to his will. 
So, of course, we can choose to pray or intercede for one another at any time. We can choose to do that. But again, some people experience that desire so strong that they're compelled to intercede for one another. I've been with people in my lifetime. I've even had it happen to me on a, on a, a few occasions. Not always, but a few occasions. But I've been with people that, you know, we're just talking. We might be in the car, or we might be at dinner, or we might be visiting at their house. And all of a sudden, they sense this burden to pray. And it's not like, well, I'll pray tomorrow. It's like, turn the TV off, we're praying right now. Okay. <laughs> they were compelled to pray. I was like, okay, we can pray. But they were compelled to pray. They were going to their knees regardless of what I did. And I'm the guest in their house, right? But they sense God's calling. You all read the book, Jesus is Calling, right? Jesus Calling. Well, he's re he is calling. But God's calling us to a deeper relationship with him. He's calling us to be in relationship and be so in tune with him so that when he says, I need someone to pray, I'm looking for somebody who will pray for this situation. Well, I don't know what the situation is. You don't have to. My Holy Spirit's going to help you. So there are those that are compelled. But again, compelled or not, notice what Paul says when he, he, has, he felt the necessity to urge Timothy and those Timothy led to intercede on the behalf of people. In 1 Timothy 2.1, he said, I urge then, first of all. When do we pray? First. Pray first. First of all. Now, he not only means first of all pray, but now he gives us a list of the people he wants you to pray for first. He said, first of all, petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for who? All people. Some people? All people. People I like? Yes. People I don't like? Yes. How many know it's fun to pray for people you don't like? It's fun to pray for people you don't like and then see God answer that prayer. And then you're like, uh. Right? It's kind of like, um, uh, who was it at Nineveh? Jonah? God told him to go preach to the Ninevites and, and they would be saved. And he goes, I'm not doing it. Why won't you do it? Because I know you'll save them. And I don't like them. Wow, I won't pray for them. I won't even go talk to them. So God had a plan for that. So I urge you <laughs> that you don't end up in any mouth of a big fish. All right. So I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving be made for all people. So here are three characteristics. We're going to go quickly because i got a lot of ground to cover, and i just got like 26 minutes to do it, okay? Or 36. 36. Three characteristics of intercession. Number one is a strong connection. A strong connection. How many know on these cell phones, right? On these cell phones, sometimes your connection gets a little fuzzy. And what we hate, what do we hate the most? Dropped calls. We hate those, right? But this isn't the kind of connection I'm talking about in intercession. In intercession, you always, you'll never have a dropped call with God. His ears are open to the cries of the righteous. Come on, that's what the Bible says. His ears are open to the cries of the righteous. How many in here are righteous? Oh, yeah, if you're saved, you better raise your hand. Because your righteousness, your righteousness is as filthy rags. But God's righteousness is yours in Christ Jesus. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Therefore, what he said, I'll hear the cries of the righteous. That means he hears your cry. That means when you pray, God hears you. That means when you dial up, he always answers. Right? Jesus on the main line. Come on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just a few of you. <laughs> that was a song. Thank you. Somebody said, Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Strong connection. What is a strong connection? Well, it's love. The strongest connection in prayer is love. Love is the catalyst for all praying. Well, what if I have to pray for somebody I don't like? You may not like them, but you have to love them. Right? Love is the catalyst for all prayer, and especially intercession. 
Why? Because compassion is a part of divine love. And that strong connection is a connection of compassion and empathy about a person knowing that they're walking through something that they cannot get themselves out of. How many know people like that? Whether it be physical, like a physical disease they can't get themselves out of. It could be mental health issues they can't get themselves out of. It could be financial, marital. There's all kinds of issues that people face in their life. And you know what? We can pray for them. And, and, it, and the, 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 when we're compelled to pray for them, there's this strong connection to them. It's a strong connection based out of love. That I love them. I don't want them to see them going through that. The Bible says this, Greater love has no man than to lay down his life for a friend. That is exactly what intercessory prayer is. You are laying down your life for somebody else because you love them. Greater love. And that's that divine strong connection that you have them with them. It speaks to the core motivation behind intercession. Here's what Paul said in Galatians. Notice how he says it. Galatians 4.19 uh, says this, my little children, so Paul's talking to the church at Galatia, and he calls them my little children. And I mean, with, all, with a straight face, he says this. Do you know what I mean? With a, with a real uh, depth of meaning, he says, my little children. When I look at you, if I said, okay, my little children, you, and, and, and I, you'd probably start laughing if I called you my little children. But Paul... They were his children. Why were they his children? Because he started the church at Galatia. They were his children. They were the ones that got born again under his ministry. And so when he says, my little children, first of all, he's talking about a strong connection. But then notice what he says, over whom I travail. What is travail? Any, any ladies in here ever had a baby? You know what travail is. It's that thing that no man ever wants to experience. We look at it and we say, oh my God. I've seen men pass out over that, or heard of men passing out over a woman travailing. You did that, sir? Hallelujah. God bless your wife. But uh, uh, it's one of those things. When, that travail is such a, it's, it's intense so that strong connection brings empathy, brings intensity to your prayer for somebody else. It's not the, oh, I'll pray for you, and then you forget about it. It's the, I'll pray for you. Give me some more detail. I want some more detail because I want to pray for you. I want to pray very specifically for you. It's not, I want more detail so I can go tell your story to everybody else. It's intensity. It's a connection. My little children over whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. What is he praying for them? He wants Christ to be formed in them. Paul identified with the members of this church. He had a connection with this church. And he was responsible for, for them even being there. And he was uh, empathetic in prayer as well as in his message to them. My little children. And then number two, you need to be willing, a, uh, make a willing sacrifice. Willing sacrifice. <clears throat> God rewards those who willingly stand in the gap for others. When I say stand in the gap, I don't know if, how many people have been involved in church for a long, long time or have heard pr teaching on prayer, but there's a scripture that talks about standing in the gap, okay? But let me say this, what it means to stand in the gap. You're standing between a person and God. And you're trying to bring the power of God in to bear on that person's life. You're standing in the gap for them because they cannot do it for themselves. That went over really well. Thank you for the one lonely clap back there. Did you hear what I said? You're standing in the gap. It could be life or death. Right? And we want to make it life for life. And how do we do that? We stand in the gap on behalf of that person before God and we go to God. It's the same thing that uh, Abraham did with Lot. 
Remember, Abraham went to God and said, if there be, if there be 20 righteous, what was he doing? He was interceding on the behalf of the Christians that were in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's interceding with God. If there be 20 righteous, he said, if there be 10, what if he have said, if there be one? What do you think God would have done? But he stopped at 10 and there were not 10 righteous people in that city. And <clears throat> God destroyed that city. But it's the same thing. On the behalf of that city, uh, Abraham was praying. And so look here, uh, willing sacrifice. God rewards those willing to stand in the gap. Much of the sacrifice made in intercession, listen to this, revolves around the amount of time you spend in prayer. That's much of the sacrifice, right? Uh, um, greater love has no man than he lays down his life for another, right? I mean, you don't have to jump in front of a, a bullet. You just have to get in the carpet. You know what I mean? For an extended period of time. And if I could go further into this, I would. But I'm going to tell you what. <clears throat> if you're compelled in intercession and you sense the burden of intercession praying for a person. Let me give you a person exa an example. Damar. When I say Damar, what do, what do people remember? What do they think? Well, they think number three, right? Why? Because number three got more than his bell rung. He literally, in front of national t a national TV audience, almost lost his life playing football. And what happened? People started praying. People started hitting their knees. And probably not just for a little bit. They, didn't, they saw it. They, they saw it. That's the thing. We don't see a lot of the... If, we're, if we don't see it, it doesn't move us. That's why sometimes we need to go downtown and see people that are hurting. We need to, to put ourselves in a position to see people that don't have what we have <clears throat> so that we can, we can have that empathy to where we can say, okay, I, I might not be able to give them 10 bucks or 20 bucks, but I can pray for them. At the very least, I can pray for them. And then I can find other people that can help me and we can put feet to our efforts and try to help somebody. It's prayer. It's sacrifice. Romans 15.1, the Good News translation says, we who are strong in the faith ought to help the weak to carry their burdens. Nobody has to go it alone. Nobody. And if you're in here today and you feel alone, you don't have to be alone. As a matter of fact, a lot of times we're alone because we think we know the answer. And that's why we're alone. And we won't humble ourselves and say, I need prayer. You know, we have prayer line every Sunday morning. We have prayer team down here every Sunday morning. You know, it's not that you run to the prayer, you run to the altar for every little thing. You can pray for yourself in many instances. But there are times when we need, one puts a thousand to flight, but two put ten thousand to flight. We need the help of another person to take hold together with us against the strength of a burden that's in our life. Come on, this is important. And we shouldn't, we're a family. It's the family of God. We shouldn't be embarrassed. We should say, look, I need some help. I need some prayer. I need some prayer. I need some prayers around me right now, right? Because we've got, we've got an issue and it's a serious issue. And I need some prayers. So willingly sacrifice. Number three, bold confidence. Scripture clearly lets us know that our courage and confidence in prayer comes from Christ Jesus himself. We operate on the authority of his word and his name with the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to these three scriptures I'm going to give to you. Two of them are in your notes. First, Hebrews 4.16, ESV says this, Let us then with confidence... With confidence, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. You know, you don't have to go in shaking, wondering. You can go in confidently. Why? Because you're going in the authority of the name of Jesus. You've been invited to stand before the throne room of God and make your petition on the behalf of another person. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy 
Find grace to help in the time of need. In Ephesians 3.12, uh, um, the contemporary English version says it this way. Christ now gives us courage and confidence. Christ gives us courage and confidence. Quit saying, I have no confidence. You should have immense confidence before your God. That he is welcoming you there. The door is always open. He is never saying, I don't have time for you. Now, Christ gives us that courage and confidence so that we can come to God by faith. <coughs> I'm going to share another scripture with you. I wasn't going to, but I, I feel it's important because we're talking about having courage, having confidence to stand before God. And while I have confidence, we always have confidence when we have knowledge. When we know that we know that we know something, right? When we know that we know that we know, nobody can take that away from you. I've used this analogy before, but it's like, what's your name? What's your name? How do you know? They've been lying to you the whole time. Are you sure? Are you confident? What, put, what gives you all that confidence? You know. He knows his name. He knows his name. You can't, you can't tell him his name is not his name because he knows his name. Right? It's the same thing when you know that you know that you know what God has promised. It cannot be taken from you. It cannot be taken. That's the confidence. And in Romans 8, 26 and 27, New Living Translation, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. What is our weakness, Paul? For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. Now we don't have knowledge. We don't know anything about the situation. Somebody calls you and says, Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Judy needs prayer, and then hangs up. Well, I don't know. Is she pregnant? Was she in a car accident? Does she need some money? What's going on with Aunt Judy? I don't know. But who knows? The Holy Spirit knows. But the Holy Spirit Prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. What's that? That's praying in other tongues. Right? But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows. The Father who knows. The Father. You don't know, but the Father knows. And He knows all hearts. And He knows what the Spirit is saying. Because the Spirit knows. And the Father knows. And the Spirit goes on your behalf before the throne room of God to pray for something that your weakness is that you don't know about it. And He stands before the throne room. And it says in the Spirit pleads. Do you know what that word pleads mean? He pleads a case just like an attorney would plead a case before God. Here's the deal. They're having problems. And your servant, your intercessor is praying. And he wants an answer. She wants an answer. And I need an answer from you. What's the will of God in this situation? And he says, the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will concerning that situation. Don't tell me praying in tongues isn't important. It's, it's vitally important. Why? Because you don't know what you don't know. But God does. And so pray the outcome. Pray the outcome. Six things very quickly. Now I have 20 minutes. I did pretty good on that. Don't you think we got through that? A little attaboy would help. Okay. All right. Pray the outcome. Pray the outcome. Number one, when I'm praying for another person, I'm just randomly praying for somebody. I want to pray for them. Let's say, let's say every male in here under 30, raise your hand. Every male in here under 30, are you, under 35, under 35, under 35. Okay, I made a decision. I'm going to pray for every male in here under 35. I'm going to pray for them, okay? Well, what am I going to pray? Because there's a group here. There's what, about five of you, six of you? Yeah, about six of you. So I'm going to pray for six different men. Under the age of 35, what could I pray? What could I possibly pray for those guys? Oh, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to pray, number one, that they know God's will for their life. I'm going to pray they know God's will for their life. Well, who could I pray this for? How about your kids? Do you have a connection with your kids? Yeah, a strong one. 
We can intercede for our own flesh and blood. So pray they know God's will for their life. Again, with connection, sacrifice, and confidence, Paul begins in chapter 1 of his letter to the Colossians, showing us what is the desired outcome and how to pray for it. And he's praying for members at the church of Colossae. Okay? This is his prayer. The Bible is a prayer book, and it's filled with prayers, right? You don't need to write a prayer book. I mean, we have a prayer guide, but you don't need... To, this one's got real prayers anointed by the real Holy Ghost. I said ghost. Anyway. <laughs> that's an inside... That's an inside... Okay. Colossians 1.9. For this reason... Here's Paul, Colossians 1.9. For this reason, since the day we heard about every single male in here under 35 years old, since the day I heard about these guys, I'm looking at it, it's today. <laughs> I heard about you today, all right? So since the day I heard about you guys, I will not stop or I have not stopped praying for you. What are you praying for us, Paul? What are we going to pray for these guys? We continually ask God... The number one thing we ask him is to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So the number one thing I'm going to pray for you guys is that you're going to be filled with wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives regarding the will of God for your lives. I'm praying that for you. Prayer is an essential element to knowing and understanding the will of God for our lives. It's the essential element. It cannot be found, knowing the will of God for your life cannot be found without the action of prayer. You can't just wander through life and say, well, if God wanted me to know, he'd tell me. No, you ask him. Because he wants to know how bad you want to know. He wants to know if you, what are you going to do when you find out? Right? So prayer is essential. It cannot be found without it. That is why it is important to intercede for others as well as spend time with God for yourself. Prayer, this kind of prayer, is the kind of prayer that you pray early and often for every single person you love. If you love them and you know them, pray for them. Right? So pray the will of God. Number two, pray they do the will of God in their life. It's one thing to know the will of God. How many have ever known the will of God but didn't want to do it? I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to do that. I know it's your will, but I don't want to do that. I know I'm supposed to do this, that, A, B, C, D, and F, but I, I might do E, but the rest of them, I'm not doing that. So I know it, but I'm not doing it. Colossians 1.10. We have not stopped praying for you so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. What pleases God? Faith pleases God. The Bible tells us faith pleases God. What is knowing the will of God and doing the will of God? It's faith. You know it by faith, you do it by faith. Come on now. This is so important. This is so important. Pray they do the will of God for their lives. Pray they would know God's will, that they would have the right attitude towards what God is telling them. I'm praying for every guy in here under 35 that his attitude is right. That when God speaks to him, that he has of the right attitude to receive what God's saying. That he's not going to rebel against it. But he's going to have the right attitude about it. And pray they would align themselves and their behaviors with God's will. I'm praying that they would have the right attitude to receive it. I'm praying that they will align themselves and their behaviors with the things God is asking them to do. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to keep doing the will of God. I'm going to pray that they keep doing the will of God, even if it feels awkward and uncomfortable even if it moves them from their comfort zone to face something they've never known. I'm praying they're going to face it. How many, uh, no, that's like me trying to ride a horse, learning to ride a horse. 
How many know it can be done, but it might be uncomfortable? Right? I've never, I mean, I, you know what I'm saying. I, I, I can count on one hand how many times I've ridden a horse in 63 years on one hand. Right? I don't know anything about it other than what that guy who was pulling the rein. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, sit there and hold on. Right? And I'm like, okay, put your feet in those things right there. Don't wear sh uh, tennis shoes. Okay. I'm like, okay, I, I got that part. But this other part where... <laughs> I don't even know what that means. It must mean go. But anyhow, that whole thing that they do, I, 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 I mean, I could learn, but for a long time it's going to be out of my comfort zone. It's the same thing. God wants to take you to places that are going to be good for you. But when you start going that way, they don't seem like they're going to be good for you. Sometimes God's will for you to, is to stay put. To sit your behind in that seat and be taught. I've been there. And preparation time is never wasted time. Ever wasted. And that, but sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. Why? Because I want to go do something for God. You can't do anything for God in your state. You know what I'm saying? You need to get some things. You need to get some freedom. You need to get some freedom of, from some things. So that you can actually freely and confidently do what God's called you to do. Well, whew. number three, pray they live a productive life. So now they know God's will. Now they're willing to do God's will and they're doing it. But I want to pray they live, live a productive life. In Colossians 1.10, we have not stopped praying for you since we've heard of you. That you would bear fruit in every good work. I'm praying for every man in here under 35 that they would bear good fruit in every good work. That their fruit would be lasting. That their fruit would have eternal consequence. That people's lives would be changed for eternity. And not only those lives, but the lives of people that they'll never meet will also be changed because they obeyed God. They were productive. John 15, 16 says, We are chosen to bear good fruit, good and lasting fruit. Number four, pray their relationship with God is growing. Colossians 1.10, we have not stopped praying for you, that you would grow in the knowledge of God. Growing in your relationship with God, what does it do? When you grow in your relationship with God, what does that do? Well, number one, it increases your love for him. I mean, it just goes to show, you know, when you grow in your relationship, like say husband and wife, right? Husband and wife. Maybe, maybe daughter-mother uh, relationship when they grow, father-son relationship, any kind of relationship. When you're growing in that relationship and it's healthy, what is produced? Well, good fruit, but love, right? Love's good fruit. Love's the fruit of the Spirit. When you grow in that, when you grow, when you grow in that relationship, the love grows. Well, when you grow in your relationship for God, with God, I mean, no, God loves you as much as he's ever going to love you. He can't love you anymore, but you can love him more. You can love him more. And what happens when you love God more? Well, loving God results in your obedience. The more you love him, the easier it is for you to obey him. Why? Why is it easier to obey him when you fall in love with him, because you know that anything he asks you to do, he's going to have your best interest in heart. He's never going to ask you to do anything that he hasn't prepared you to do. He's never going to ask you to do anything that you're not going to, you're not going to have a, an overwhelming level of success in if you do it his way. So when you love him, you're obedient. The more you know him, the more you love him, the easier it is to obey when you obey him, you're going to flourish, okay? And so look here, uh, and obedience also brings this. Obedience to God always brings contentment. Paul said, I've learned to be content. Well, learning is the equivalent of growing. 
I've learned to be a, a, a content. I've grown in my relationship with God to the point that I am always content. I always know that regardless of the situation, we're coming out on top. Why? Because God is my God. Well, what does that got to do with anything? Has everything to do with anything, right? Why? How do I know I'm coming out on top? Because I'm the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, right? Nothing that the devil, nothing that the enemy wants to try to put against us is he going to prosper in. You say, well, you lost a child. Yeah, and he's in heaven. Right? I mean, I'm looking forward to heaven. We speak as if it was a bad place to go. It's kind of a good place to go. Right? God took care of that for me. You follow what I'm getting at? There are certain circumstances that happen in our life and we look at them as if they are bad. But they're not bad at all. We may not like the outcome. We may not prefer the outcome. But God knows more than we know. And the secret thing belongs to the Lord. I'm getting back on that. I got on that two, uh, two Sundays ago. Uh, um, number five, pray they benefit from God's power in their life. Colossians 1.11. He's writing this. This is one chapter to the church of Col uh, Colossae. Uh, we have not stopped praying for you, he said, being that you would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. How many think I'd like some great endurance and patience? Where does it come from? When you're strengthened with God's power, then you're, you're able to have great endurance and great patience. I want you strengthened. I'm praying for every man in here under 35 that he's going to be patient. If you haven't learned patience by 35, you're in for a big trouble. It's true. I mean, it's absolutely true. We have to be patient. We have to endure certain things. Endurance is endurance. Endurance in this scripture means endurance in natural things. Endurance in circumstances. Knowing that while it doesn't look like I'm overcoming right now, I know I'm overcoming because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. We're going through this come hell or high water. And we will come out on the other side better. What is that? That's endurance. At 35, you need to know that. When your kids are getting older, <laughs> you need to know that. When you're having to deal with the things that come as you get older, you need to know these things. Notice how he said it to the church at Ephesus. In Ephesians 3, 16, he said, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he's talking, I'm praying to God that God out of his glorious riches, I mean, think God has some glorious riches. I mean, there ain't nobody else that has more glorious riches. Out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Why do I need to be strengthened in my inner being? It's called having spiritual fortitude. It's, taught, it's, called, it's, it's about being able to stand up in the face of adversity and never quit going, never quit moving forward. That's what I'm praying for you. That you're not going to just one day say, oh, that Jesus stuff. Because there, there's an enemy out there trying to get you to change your mind. He's trying to get you to turn around. He's trying to, to get you to, to um, bail, so to speak. Bail on this Jesus stuff. And it's not Jesus stuff. You need to endure. You need to endure. We endure hardship as a good soldier is what Paul said. And it might have even been Peter. <laughs> Pray they benefit from God's power. Why do we need the power of the Holy Spirit? Because without it, everything we do is a work of the flesh. And did you know that the Bible says that the flesh never works the will of God? So we are fully dependent upon him. Finally, we'll close with this. <clears throat> Again, it goes back to attitude. Pray they have the right attitude in life. Pray they have the right attitude in life. Colossians 1.12, we've not stopped praying for you joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Our attitude impacts every area of our life. Knowing this causes us to pray for those we love to do what? Maintain joy and a positive attitude. 
We want you to maintain joy and a positive attitude regardless of the circumstance. Not everything's easy, but you can choose joy and have a good attitude about it. Not everything's easy. Some things are hard, but it's not your neighbor's fault. It's not your wife's fault. It's not your kid's fault, and it's not the dog's fault. You guys know what I'm talking about. Who do we hurt the most? The people closest to us. Why do we have to maintain a good attitude so we don't hurt the people closest to us? We love them and we expect them to, well, they just know me. And I can act any way I want to act and they got to love me. That's terrible. That's a terrible attitude. It is. It's a horrible attitude. Because you are ruining the best thing that God ever gave you with that attitude. That's why we're praying you have a good attitude, that you're joyful, that when you come home and the wife says, honey, don't go in the garage. Just call the wrecker. You don't go, oh my God, what are we going to do? You know what I'm saying? We just get so upset. It's a car, ladies and gentlemen. It, they make them every day. Every day. They make new ones. You have insurance, just file it. Pay your deductible and be glad nobody got hurt. Right? We burnt the toast. How many marriages have been lost over burnt toast? Are you kidding me? Be joyful. Scrape it off. (laughs) We've done that, right? Scrape it off. You might burn it next time. So maintain joyful and positive attitudes. Now listen to this. This isn't in your notes. You can write this down. We're going to pray and close. I've got two minutes. Prayer. Prayer. This is important. Is the beginning of true transformation. Bible reading is important. It's absolutely important. Bible study is important. But the beginning of real transformation comes in prayer. Why? Because you have to surrender yourself. You have to surrender yourself. You have to quiet yourself. You have to talk to God. And you have to let Him reveal to you the things that you need to see so transformation can happen. So prayer is the beginning, beginning of real transformation. But listen to this. But a willful. How many know what an aversion is? An aversion. I knew I shouldn't have used that word. Yeah. An aversion. Let me, let me say this sentence and then you'll know what it means. But a willful aversion, aversion towards change. I want to avert change. I do not want change happening in my life. I like my life the way my life is. I like myself the way I am. This is who I am and the way God made me, blah, 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 blah. Right? But a willful aversion towards change is evidence. It's evidence that you've abandoned a life of prayer. If you don't want transformation... If you don't want change, if you don't want to draw nearer to God, if you don't want to grow, if you're not hungry for Him, then what you're saying, it's like a billboard saying, I don't pray. I don't pray. I don't pray. I don't pray. Because God might ask me to do something I don't want to do, so I'm not praying. Because He might ask me to do something I don't want to do, and I don't want to do it. So I don't pray because I don't want to change, right? But prayer, a real life of prayer, will be the beginning of a total transformation of your life for the positive. It's at this point we need people to pray. So if you're in here this, this evening and you're saying, I don't want to change, I am not willing and how many know we can sit in church? Man, this is going to be like stepping on toes, but I'm going to say it anyway. <clears throat> we can sit in church and act like we want to change, but we don't have a, we have no, um, 
intention of making any godly change in our life. We're just coming here for other motives. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's all kinds of motives, people. There's all kinds of things that bring people to church. I remember one time I was pastoring in Alamogordo. Now I'm going over and I'm meddling, but that's okay. I was pastoring in Alamogordo, and I don't know what possessed me because I'd never said it before, and I've never said it again. But I said it this. I said, some people just go to church to try and find people to sell stuff to. Two guys in the back got up and walked out. Never seen them before. They got up and walked out. I think their motive was wrong. I think God called them out. So here's the thing. We've got to decide. I, I, I love what um, Samantha said the other, night, the other morning in our, in our meeting. She said the, 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 the thing that's keeping most people from growing is that they're not willing to, to, to let God have everything. They hold on to their will. Their will is not broken. They don't want him nearly as much as they want the thing that's keeping him, them from him. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And that's not the attitude that will cause us to be successful in prayer. And we'll be miserable as Christians, I promise you. Nothing worse than a miserable Christian. They're angry. They are. They're just angry. I want to be a joyful Christian, don't you? I want to be happy. So there we go. We'll talk about happiness oh, some other time. Everybody stand up. We're going to pray. I sure appreciate you listening to me. And I hope that uh, there were some things that you were able to pick up and be able to use in your life. Because I believe that God wants you to, to spend time with him praying about people that you care about. Father, we thank you for each person in here. I thank you that the entrance of your word always gives light. Father, help us to identify where we've grown tonight and build on it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great evening.